easily. Right. This is what we call the law of max action. And it was proposed by Cato Maximilian Goldberg and Peter Waag as a general description for the equilibrium condition. And it states that for a reaction of some general type, where you've got A and B going to some product C and D, and you've got the corresponding coefficients out in front, the law of mass action is represented by the following equilibrium expression. Our K, big K, is going to be our products over the reactants. And if you learn nothing else today, right, if you pull nothing else out of this chapter, it is that K is equal to our products over our reactants. And we're going to raise these guys to whatever the X, whatever the coefficient is. So if you looked at this and this guy was like 2C, right, we would really have K is equal to the concentration of C times the concentration of C times the concentration of D, right? And that's just the same thing as saying C squared. So if you're wondering why we can pull this coefficient out and raise it to a power, that's why we're just multiplying all of the products, whatever they are, right? We're gonna make two C's, right? So we're gonna multiply all of our products and divide it by the product of all of the reactants. Right, so it's going to be products over reactants, and you exponentiate to whatever those are. Now, this number K, right, this value K over here, is going to be called the equilibrium constant K. And that's another one of those things that's going to be experimentally determined. Right? At any given time T, the system can be sampled to determine the amounts of reactants and products present. A ratio of products to reactants calculated in the same manner as K, tells us whether or not the system has come to equilibrium or not. So when Q is equal to K, we're at equilibrium. So if we go back to this slide over here, right, and we measure the concentration of our three species at this point, right, we're then going, to, that's going to give us Q when it's not at equilibrium. Over here at equilibrium, and we measure these guys, concentration, and we do K, is equal to products over reactants. We're going to get some number for this ratio of products to reactants. Right? Q is not necessarily going to be equal to K. Q is at any given instant. Right? And K is always going to be at equilibrium. So sometimes you will see K with a subscript EQ for equilibrium constant. So if Q is equal to K, we're at equilibrium, no changes. If the reaction has to proceed further to form reactants or products, that's when Q is going to be less than K. Or if we've got too many products, it's going to go backwards and reverse our reaction, and we're going to form reactants from our products. And that's when Q is bigger than K. We're going to use the molar concentrations without units of the substances in the reaction, and that's where we're going to symbolize that using our square brackets, like so. So for a general reaction where we've got A and B going to C and D, Q is the same formula as K. We're going to have C to the C times D to the D power divided by A to the A power and B to the B power. So in an example where we've got uh, ammonia and oxygen reacting to form uh, nitrogen dioxide and water, we're going to calculate Q like this, where we've got the concentration of NO, raised to the fourth power times the concentration of H2O raised to the sixth power. Right? Those are our coefficients divided by our reactants, NH3 and O2. And we're going to use the exponent is the same thing as the coefficient that we've got out here. Right? So really simple setup. And you're going to do this setup again and again and again and again, both for K values and for Q value. So the range of equilibrium constants, they can be 1, bigger than 1, less than 1. We're never going to have a negative number because their concentrations can never be negative. But if K is small, it means that we're not going to form a lot of products relative to the amount of reactants, right? Because K is going to be our ratio of our products 
over our reactants. And so if I've got one over 100, right, that's a small k value. And a lot of these k's can be very, very small. Right? That represents something that's a, a non or a less spontaneous reaction. Right? You can have something that's got a large k. Right? I've got 100 green to one brown, right? I'm gonna have a large number that is bigger than one. Right? And these often represent spontaneous reactions. Right? And then you have something that's in between. It's around one-ish, right? Four over five, or more like uh, 24 to 24 to 22, right? Or something like that. So these ones are about, about one. When the value of K is much, much bigger than one, so when the reaction week reaches equilibrium, there are gonna be many more product molecules present than reactant molecules. When K is bigger than one, the position of the equilibrium is gonna favor the products. And we can say that that reaction is product favored. When the value of K is much, much less than one, when the reaction reaches equilibrium, there's gonna be many more reactant molecules present than product molecules. So when K is less than one, the position of the equilibrium favors the reactants, and we say that's reactant favored. So there's a few rules, right? We can combine reactions. So you would have done this with Hess's law. Um, you did this with reaction mechanisms where you're gonna combine reactions. We can do the same thing. We can look at overall big K values, just like we could have looked at change in enthalpy values. So if you have a re equation that is uh, reversed, so we've got a balanced chemical equation, we look at the reverse reaction, our new K is just gonna be one over the old K. And let me step that out for you, right? So if we had like A going to B, right? In our initial forward reaction, Okay, forward, we're going to do products over reactants, right? So this is going to be B over A. For our reverse reaction, we're going to take B and reform A, right? We're still going to do products over reactants. It's just that A is the product now, and now B is a reactant. And if we look at this, these two K values are the inverse of each other. And when we take the inverse of something, we can either do one over it, or we can do K to the negative one power. If you multiply things by N, you're just gonna raise this to another power. So if I'm gonna multiply my coefficients, instead of having uh, A, I've got two A goes to two B. Right? We're going to write the K for that. That's going to come out as B times B over A times A. Or an easier way to write that is just B squared over the concentration of A squared. All right, so if you multiply that coefficient out in the front, so I double my equation, I'm going to raise k to whatever power. That's going to be our original k to whatever power you've got. If I have several equations that I add together, right, I'm just going to multiply my k's. So I've got something where I've got a goes to b and c goes to d. Right, we can combine those two balanced chemical equations. Our initial K would be B over A, and K2 would be C over D, but when I combine them to match this balanced chemical equation, I would get the concentration of B times the concentration of D over the concentration of A times the concentration of C, and that's the same thing as just taking this guy and this guy and multiplying them Some conclusions about our equilibrium expression. The equilibrium expression for a 
reaction is the reciprocal of that of the reverse reaction. Our balanced equation for the reaction is multiplied by a factor of n. We just raise that n to an exponent. And k values are customarily written without units, which is absolutely frightening. So when the reaction is written reversed, i.e. backwards, with the equilibrium constant, k is inverted. So our equilibrium expression was AA plus BB goes to CC and DD. Our forward reaction, we've got C to the C times D to the D. And we'll have A to the A times B to the B. If we reverse that and rewrite it as C, C plus DD goes to AA and BB. Our K reverse is just going to be making A the products and B the products and C and D the reactants. So therefore, it's 1 over. When the coefficients of an equation are multiplied by a factor, we're just going to raise it to the factor. We've got AA plus BB goes to CC. Our K1 is just going to be C to the C divided by A to the A times B to the B. If we double it, we're going to get twice as much. We're just going to multiply all of those exponents by whatever this multiplicative factor is out here. So we're going to take all of those things. We're going to get C to the 2C and A to the 2 times a and b to the 2 times b, where we take our whole thing and we pull that square out. So we're just going to take this whole thing and raise it to whatever we multiplied it by. And for our last one, if you add equations together, so if we've got a and b, and we got b goes to c, we're going to combine those equations. Our k1 is b to the b over a to the a, and k2 is c to the c over b to the b. When we're our forward reaction, where we get a to the c, a goes to c, our equilibrium expression is going to be multiplying those two together. So we'll have a to the a on the bottom, and then b to the b on the top, times c to the c over b to the b. Those two b to the b's cancel out, and we'll get k3, which is just going to be the sum of those guys, and we're going to get by multiplying those two together. Yep. So let's do a quick clicker question or concept check. What is the name given to the process where the products of a reaction react to form the reactants? Pause, come back, we'll take a look. Well, that's a pretty easy one, right? It's a equilibrium process. Right? For our reaction where we've got two hydrogens and one oxygen gas forming water gas, we've got a K value of 2.5 at 300 degrees C. If we've got a concentration of H2 and O2, that's 0.05 molar, and a concentration of 0 .075, 0 0.0075 molar, in which direction will this reaction proceed to establish equilibrium? And what is the relationship between Q and K? All right, pause, work it out, and then come back. Okay, good. The first thing you would have needed to do was calculate Q. Q is calculated in the same way as any of the other ones, where we're going to have um, Q being equal to our products over our reactants, where we'll have water squared over hydrogen concentration squared, because there's two over there, times the oxygen concentration. We plug in the actual number. We get 0 0.0075 squared divided by 0 0.05 squared times 0.05. And we get 0.45, so Q is less than K. And our reaction is going to go to the left. Right? And so if you think about it, if K is going to be equal to 0.25, right, the reaction is going to move so that whatever my products to reactants ratio is I'm either going to consume reactants or products so that we get this fraction here equal to 2.5. And since this guy is 0.45, it means we got too big of a number on the bottom. We need to make this guy up on the top grow, and we need to make this one on the bottom decrease. So it's going to go to the left and regenerate our reactants. Section 12.2, the equilibrium constant. Describing the chemical equilibria in an ammonia synthesis reaction. So the equilibrium constant K always has the same value at a given temperature. If we change the temperature, all bets are off, but at a given temperature, it's gonna stay the same. So at 500 degrees C, 
the value for K for this reaction is 6 times 10 to the minus 2. So whenever N2, H2, and NH3 are mixed together at this temperature, the system will always come to an equilibrium position so that the ratio of NH3 squared over N2 times H2 to the cubed is going to be 6 times 10 to the minus 2. It doesn't say what the actual numbers are. Right? It's not going to care about these actual numbers. It's this ratio of products to reactants that matters. So maybe we can decrease one of these right? or increase one of these. Right? Whatever happens, the concentrations of the others are going to adjust so that we end up at the same spot each time. Right? So it's regardless of the amounts of the gases, it's the ratio, not the amounts that are initially mixed together. The special ratio of products to reactants is defined by the equilibrium expression as constant for a given reaction system at a given temperature. Equilibrium concentrations will not always be the same, but that ratio will be. The equilibrium constant, which depends on the ratio of concentrations, remains the same within experimental error. Each set of equilibrium concentrations, so a system has one unique equilibrium constant at a particular temperature, but has an infinite number of equilibrium positions, right? So if you've got two things on the top and two things on the bottom, right, there's lots of play as to how we can get that number, right? So if my equilibrium constant is two, I could have like two over one, Right? Or I could have 20 over 10, or I could have you know, 2 times 2 over uh, 2 cubed or something. Right? So the actual numbers that go in here are kind of free to float around a bit. Right? But that ratio, that K value, is always going to be the same at a given temperature. So you can make 0.25 out of a lot of different fractions. The specific equilibrium positions adopted by a system depends on the initial concentrations, but the equilibrium constant does not. So depending on what you put in, you're going to get different specific numbers, but that ratio will be the same each time. So the following results were collected from two experiments involving the reaction at 600 degrees C between sulfur dioxide and oxygen to form sulfur trioxide. So we've got a series of initial concentrations and then equilibrium concentrations in experiment number one. If we look at experiment number two, we've got different initial concentrations. But if we look out at equilibrium, our concentrations are going to change. But what's not going to change is the ratio between those. All right? So in this first one, we didn't have any oxygen whatsoever, right? But our ratio involves oxygen. So what we see in experiment number two is we're going to form some oxygen. Right? Um, I don't remember what's going to happen with experiment number one. We got a little bit of everything, right? But we're going to see what happens. The equilibrium constant is constant. That's why it's called a constant. So the balanced chemical reaction for our equation is that we take two SO2s and some oxygen, and we're going to make some sulfur trioxide from our law of mass action. K is going to be SO2 squared divided by, sorry, SO2 squared, SO3 squared divided by SO2 squared and O2 to the first power. It's just our exponents. So all we got to do is start plugging in those numbers. So for experiment number one, we'll take 3.5 and we'll square it and we'll take uh, 1.25 and we'll take our 1.5 and square it. And we end up with 4.36. In experiment number two, now we're taking these new equilibrium values, 2.6 and 5.9 and 0.045, right? And we end up with roughly the same number. Because the value of K, the ratio of those things, is the constant within a 